everyone. Our next speaker is the University of Washington Department of Psychology Professor, Associate Professor Shannon Dorsey. She conducted her or earned her undergraduate degree at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. She received a doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Georgia. And then she went on to Duke University, where she worked for seven years. She came to Seattle to the University of Washington in 2007, where she began her career here at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. We were lucky enough in 2012 to recruit her to our own Department of Psychology, where she has been very productive, garnering over $5 million in research funding, and to date she's published 45 publications. Her work also focuses on global health, but she focuses on proving the mental health treatment gap in low and middle income countries by testing ways to deliver therapy that are sustainable. She's trained individuals who are not mental health professionals to deliver mental health care. This is important given the shortage of mental health um, professionals that exist in most low and middle income countries. She's worked in Tanzania and Kenya, where she's trained lay counselors to work with children who've been orphaned and are suffering from post-traumatic stress or maladaptive grief. And she's also worked in southern Iraq and on the Thai-Burma border. The goal of her research generally is to try and improve mental health outcomes for children, both in the United States and globally, by increasing their access to mental health therapies that are effective. It's my personal honor to introduce my colleague, Associate Professor Shannon Dorsey. So it's great to be here. It's a big night for the UNC Chapel Hill. I'm kind of glad UNC never plays UW since I went there as an undergrad and Kate went there for her PhD, so it's good we don't compete on anything. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of what Kate alluded to. These two talks go together so nicely. We work together all the time. Funny story. We've actually only met each other twice because I left Duke before we started working together, even though Kate's at Duke, so we're on Skype video every week, but this is only the second time we've been in the same place, so that's kind of exciting. So uh, you'll see some of the same logos here because we work with some of the same organizations. You also see some of my colleagues who have contributed to a lot of this work as well as names of investigators here and at Duke and other places. So I don't know how many people saw this article in Nature, the Great Depression, and it's not speaking about an economic depression, but speaking more about how prevalent depression and mental illness is increasingly and what a big toll it's taken. So if people are familiar with the dailies, so years lost to disability, so it's years that are lost in terms of productivity because of illness, disease, other things. And nature calls it a world of depression. 350 million people are affected by depression. And Basically, these individuals are not getting treated because about half of the world's population lives in a country with only two psychiatrists per 100,000 people. It is after 8 p.m. Let me just say that one more time. <laughs> only two psychiatrists per 100,000 people. Now, are there any psychiatrists here? Okay, then I won't hurt anyone's feelings because really psychiatrists don't provide most of the care, right? <laughs> so psychiatrists, and most psychiatrists would agree with that. So not only are there a few psychiatrists, but there are a few social workers. There are a few psychologists. There are a few licensed counselors. There are a few marriage and family therapists. These are the people that provide care, and they are also not the people available in low- and middle-income countries worldwide. They're not going to be the solution to the problem. When you think about low- and middle-income countries, the reason we can't meet this mental health treatment gap that I'm going to be talking about is we have both scarcity, so we have few mental health professionals, but we also have inequity. So if you live in a country like Kenya and you get an advanced degree, you're probably going to move to Nairobi. You may not stay in Bongoma or Eldoret. You're going to go to an urban area. And then also you may choose to go to a country that has a higher income where you have a greater chance of doing well. So we have this inequity across and within countries, and we also have few mental health professionals to start with. So the mental health treatment gap worldwide is actually 75%. In most low and middle income countries, it's astronomically higher, and it's substantially worse for children. Now, the WHO recognizes this. They say that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and it's not merely the absence of disease or, or infirmity. But if you ask Paul Bolton, my close colleague and friend, it is the Rodney Dangerfield of international health. Mental health gets no respect in the global health field. 
So again, we're back to this treatment gap. If 75% of individuals worldwide with mental health need aren't getting treatment, and children are doing substantially worse, what's going to happen? So this is how bad it is for kids. For each child with need, 0.16% receive treatment. Now, I have probably checked that statistic 800 times because it's hard for even me to believe that it is that bad. So if you, someone asked a question about screening of mental health problems, if you meet our criteria, and I don't mean just our, I mean the WHO, I mean any criteria for a mental health need, you are 0.16% likely to get treatment if you're a child in low and middle income countries. That means my daughters, I'm making sure my Ari's are taking pictures so I can show my friend. My colleague Susan, who you're gonna hear from, this is her daughter Charity. She lives in Moshi, it's a beautiful place. You'll see lots of pictures of Kilimanjaro in my talk. She's not gonna get care if she has a need without the kind of work that I'm gonna talk about here. This young woman who um, was the daughter of a man that we worked with in a refugee camp on the Thai-Burma border for displaced individuals from Burma because of the political unrest in Myanmar, she's not gonna get mental health therapies. This is a picture from the refugee camp. My son, you're a good faculty member if you can work your child into a talk, and he happens to also have on a UW shirt. <laughs> My child, who happens to live in the beautiful land of Seattle, if he needs mental health care, it can be hard to find. When Kate was talking about local to global and global to local, despite having lots of mental health professionals, Lucy, Elizabeth, we can speak to this here, right? It's not that easy to even find a great provider for your child in Seattle, but I could throw a stone and hit one. I'm just not sure they'd be the best provider I want, but there's plenty of them. <laughs> so what we basically have is inequality and in availability of mental health treatment, and that is, I'm gonna talk mostly about our work in Africa, but it's true for all low and middle income countries, and this is something that we're gonna have to fix and it's not going to be solved with mental health professionals because if we rely on mental health professionals, we're never going to get there because there's not enough of them. What people have approached this and the way that we're trying to solve this and what the WHO actually supports is to take a task shifting or a task sharing approach where you train lay counselors, people with little to no mental health experience or training to deliver sometimes very complicated mental health interventions. And by doing this, we have a lot greater chance of being able to scale up and sustain some of the things and some of the needs that Kate pointed out in her talk. So again, you know, if what we care about is sustainability, like Kate mentioned, and we want to think about scale up to population level, it's not going to be the mental health professionals. So WHO, if you're interested in this topic, the WHO has the MH gap. If you just Google MH gap, you can read a good bit about some of their plans for addressing mental health gap. It involves using evidence-based practices, part of what I'm gonna talk about today. It also involves using task sharing and task shifting strategies. Now, there's more than one way to address the mental health gap. One way is that you could go into countries, take a more anthropological approach, and try to identify local treatments that work, that exist there, you could test and disseminate them. The other way you can do it is say, well, what are interventions that have been proven to work in other settings that we could bring into this setting? So I'm a clinical psychologist. I specialize in evidence-based treatment. So my approach has been the second. Both are valid, both are needed, but I'm gonna talk a lot about using the evidence that we know for treatments that work and bringing those into low and middle income countries because we're starting from a place of a treatment that has a foundation of empirical support. So just to show you a few of those, and then of course, I mean, it's my talk, so I'm gonna focus on my work, but just to show you some things that other colleagues have done, um, Paul Bolton, who said that, you know, global mental health is the Rodney Dangerfield, did the first randomized trial um, in Uganda with adults and adolescents who were internally displaced. Uh, Atif Rahman has done amazing work in Pakistan. I'm going to show a little bit from his manual. We've got some great work in India by Vikram Patel. Um, our colleagues and myself, we've done some great work, a great work, on the Thai Burma border and in southern Iraq with a co common elements treatment that I'm going to talk about. Um, and most of these studies focus on adults except for the one study in Uganda that was on adolescents that Bolton and colleagues did an adult study in 2003 and then went back and looked at services for adolescents. But most of this work really has been adult focused and what I also want you to see is that it's also just relatively new because the first study was in 2003 that was a rigorous randomized trial of one of these evidence-based interventions. So the work that I'm gonna talk about is mainly trauma-focused CBT, or as Kate had on her slides, grief-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. 
I'm assuming most people know cognitive behavioral therapy. Raise your hand if you know of cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's one of the best evidence-supported interventions that has some of the best effectiveness cross-culturally in the U.S. We are a very diverse country and we have some great evidence cross-culturally here. Um, and so trauma-focused CBT is just cognitive behavioral therapy that is focused on treating issues related to trauma. I'm also going to talk about some of our work with this common elements treatment approach that I mentioned we were doing in southern Iraq and then also the Thai Burma border. So first I want to tell you a little bit about trauma-focused CBT, the intervention that we're testing in Tanzania and also in Kenya. So this is a treatment that has the most evidence for child trauma. It has over 14 randomized controlled trials, basically growing almost every day. And we've had a nice body of work in both, um, well, in Zambia, Tanzania, and in Kenya. So Kate and I had a feasibility study that I'm going to present the results from today that led to what we're doing now, which is a very large randomized controlled trial in Tanzania and Kenya that I'm going to talk about. And my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, who I've also been involved with for quite some time and do a great deal of work with, we've had a lot of work going on in Zambia and Lusaka also testing trauma-focused CBT. So I'll refer to some of these studies, but I just wanted you to see. Um, the blue ones are going on right now. The gray ones were both feasibility studies that were uncontrolled and they're finished. And the green one, I'm going to present some hot off the press, pretty exciting results that it's not quite accepted, and when it's accepted, it'll probably be embargoed, so there's like a short window that I can actually talk about it, so I had to make sure it had not been accepted before I started the talk. So Kate referenced this in her presentation, but basically one of the things that POFO revealed and some other work that a colleague of ours, Karen O'Donnell, did doing some measure development is when you think about needs of orphans, one of the things that families were saying is we need help to help our children with their sadness. We don't know how to talk about it. We don't know how to help them. What do we do? So if you wonder, we're talking about orphans, right? Kate talked about trauma. There's a lot of issues with things like food scarcity when you think about a lot of the countries we're talking about. So really, where do mental health problems come in? So Kate talked about how maybe kids are too busy to really feel these mental health problems, right? Like if they're traumatized, but they've got too much going on to be impacted. She showed that they were impacted. Part of what we were interested in is how important is addressing mental health? Is that important when you do have food scarcity, when you don't have access to education? So one of the things, Leah, one of my research assistants, and I went over to Tanzania and used this rapid ethnographic approach that Johns Hopkins Group has developed called DIME. You can Google DIME and JHU and you'll pull it up. And in two weeks, we had local interviewers who trained them to do qualitative interviewing. And in two weeks, they, 18 of them basically dispersed and did interviews with orphan children and 36 guardians of orphans. And they asked basically one problem, one question. What are the problems of orphans? That's it. They didn't say mental health. They didn't say anything about where we, what we wanted to know. And they just came saying, what else? What else? What else? Is there anything else? And they've got every single problem that was listed by guardians and by children who are orphaned. And if it was a mental health problem, they followed up and asked a few more questions. I could talk about just this study all night, but I, since I want to share some other things, I will move on. But what we found is that basically, yes, kids and guardians talk about needs related to education, food, clothing, and shelter, but mental health problems are in the running. They were mentioned by guardians and children, and the analyses were not done by myself and by my colleague Leah. They were done by the local interviewers in Swahili, in the language. We taught them how to look at their interviews and decide, are these the same problems or not? So you see Dada Restituta here leading a group, and you see over there Unyanyasaji, which is a problem, and everybody's saying they had this problem on their paper for a participant, but someone might have used a slightly different wording. That's why you see different terms. So what we found is these five things, there were more, but among a list of tons and tons of problems, there were a lot of problems that were related to mental health, like bad behavior in kids, kids feeling that they were humi being humiliated or treated badly as orphans, psychological problems, kids reporting not feeling loved, and Musango Wamawazo, which is, we see this a lot internationally, just this feeling of stress and overthinking, sort of like what we talk about as pers perseveration here. And the Unyanya Saji, humiliation and treated badly, 78% of children said this in one form or another to the question of what is the problem of orphans. This was the most common answer by any orphan that we talked to. And for guardians, it was the third most common answer. So yes, they said we need money for food. Yes, they said we need money for shelter and school fees. But 
this was the third most common thing that they all said. So I wanted to show you that just to give you the picture that mental health is clearly on the minds of kids. It's on the minds of caregivers. We need things that we can do to try to help kids with these difficulties, even in a climate of food scarcity and basic need shortages. So our first study, which we started, I think, around 2008. It wasn't long after I had gotten to UW. And we had a group of 64 kids, ages 7 to 13. Half of them lived in an urban setting and half in rural because doing something in an urban location in a low-income country means nothing if you can't also do it in a rural location because you're going to reach a lot more kids rurally. So if you can't deliver the service in both places, there might not be a whole lot of point to doing it. And we assessed outcomes before treatment started. We assessed them at the end of treatment. We assessed them at the three-month follow-up. And then we asked them, we assessed them again a year after they'd finished treatment to look at maintenance of gains. This was not a controlled study. We did not follow kids who did not get an intervention because this really was about feasibility. Could the lay counselors learn the treatment? Would kids and guardians come? <laughs> are people going to come once and quit? Like, what are people going to think about this cognitive behavioral therapy approach? So the treatment approach that we took, and if you look online, you'll see tons of studies about TFCBT. We have a web-based training that has registrants from over 40 to 50 countries, so it's been very popular internationally. A colleague of mine is here who's doing implementation in Japan. And we decided to do a group intervention because it's a, more of a collectivist culture, and we thought the group might be a nice way to do it. We do it in group and individually in the U.S. And we had eight children per group. And they learned a few different things. So they, these are common aspects of other CBT models. They got psychoeducation, which is basically learning about grief, you know, post-traumatic stress, trauma, and learning about the intervention. They got coping skills, so they learned behavioral things they could do to feel better, like relaxation strategies, aspects of behavioral activation. We didn't use any of these terms. Um, you know, doing things to feel better. They also learn cognitive techniques, and no matter what country I've worked in, when we ask at the end of treatment what was the most helpful part of treatment, almost everyone says learning to think in a different way, that I can learn, that I can change the way that I think to feel better. So the cognitive strategies have been incredibly powerful, and so we teach those. You'll see a little bit of that. And then we also taught them specific strategies to handle grief. So how do you stay committed committed, connected to a parent who's died, how do you still value that relationship, how do you stay connected to other people in your life despite the fact that your main caregiver has died. So they have, this program has very specific strategies for that, and so that's one piece of that the kids got. So the way the intervention worked, and you see Dada Susan here, this is Charity's mom, um, we had children in one classroom that was usually delivered in a school setting because it was a setting kids and families were comfortable with. We could get in there on Saturdays. We couldn't do it during the week because kids go to school. They walk a long way to school. Like Kate said, guardians are selling in the market or farming or doing things, working in a small shop to support their family. So you can't pull them away. So we did the groups on Saturdays. And we had children in one classroom with two group leaders. We had guardians for of the eight children in the other classroom with one group leader. And we had a lot of joint activities that they would do together after they learned certain things so that we could build that child-guardian relationship. So remember Kate said, the quality of the caregiving is what matters. One of the things we can do with interventions is improve the quality of that caregiving, right? And we can test. One of my honor students who's also here, Lucy Dong, is going to be looking some at the guardian-child relationship and seeing if we get some changes with the intervention over time, and does that make a difference in outcomes. So we're working with the guardians, we're working with the children, and we're having them do some conjoint activities, particularly towards the end. At the end of the treatment, every session, they're doing some things together. So they're sharing information, they're practicing strategies, we're trying to connect them more and more. So what you see here are cognitive triangles. If anyone knows cognitive behavioral therapy, we talk a lot about how thoughts, feelings, and behavior are connected. Mawazo is thoughts, Hasia is feelings, Tabia is behavior. And these are our kids drawing triangles that they remembered learning from the week before, making lists of feelings, just like we would do in the US, um, and really thinking about how these thoughts, feelings, and behavior are connected. So in addition to having these group visits, so we have these group sessions, we have 12 of them. In the middle of the group, kids got four, three to four individual visits. And these individual visits were designed for kids to be able to talk about their memories related to the parent's death. So we don't have kids talk about the parent's death when we're in a large group. 
because obviously if your parent died because of murder or your parents died because of a long prolonged illness related to HIV, there's not things we want kids talking about in front of each other because you're now going to have fears about what happened to this person's parent. Plus, HIV does come up a lot, and we don't want to be disclosing anyone else's status. So they meet individually with guardians at the guardian's home, and this is an example home of a guardian that we would visit, and they would meet with the child and help the child talk about the parent's death and then share that part that the child work, wrote with the guardian to start building the guardian's support and ability to hear the story from the child and to support the child. So the guardian work is a huge piece of what we do. We spend as much time with the guardians as we do with the kids because, like Kate said, services can not only tar target the child, they've got to target the family. We also encourage the guardians the skills they learn to use not only with the child who's in the group but with the other kids that are in the home and not only the orphans. So I wanted to tell you a little bit before I show you the outcomes what counselor training looks like when you're working with lay counselors who have you know, little to no mental health training. So I'm going to show you some pictures from different countries, not just the work in Tanzania um, and Kenya. But basically, we're always working with someone who is either a high school level provider or maybe has a, usually a bachelor's degree or a bachelor's equivalent, but not typically in a mental health program. So you might be in social work, but it's not clinical social work like you think of here. Um, it might be in education. Because we ideally have someone who has some experience with kids but they don't have mental health coursework. So we spend a lot of our time doing behavioral rehearsals and doing lots of practice where we may teach about something, and it may, but it's only 30 minutes of teaching, and then they spend an hour, so double the amount of time, practicing in a small group, getting feedback from a trainer or a colleague, coming together to share. And then after they're trained, even before they ever see a real child or a real guardian, they're practicing and role playing with each other with feedback so that you really build up your skills because it's really different if you haven't had like a master's degree in mental health or had you know coursework in clinical kind of fields. So the other thing that we have our counselors do is they have weekly Skype call, I mean sorry, we have either with this study we actually had weekly Skype calls directly with the counselors, but in most of my studies the counselors talk to a supervisor and the supervisor talks to me, but because this was a smaller study, I actually talked directly to the counselors. And we spend, you know, again, a lot of the training practicing. What would you do with a kid who feels like they have a stressed or tense body? What would be the right strategy? What would you do with a kid who, you know, can't stop thinking about their mom or dad who died? What would be the different types of activities that might help a kid like that feel better? And we spend a lot of time practicing, so that's a role play completion high five at the bottom. Um, lots of coaching. So um, this is from some of our work on the Thai Burma border. You know, you've got people practicing. I've got a translator by me because I don't speak Burmese. So um, basically, you have two people role playing, and I'm getting kind of translation of what they're saying and doing, and then I'm able to give a little bit of feedback through the translator. So it's kind of quick, and then at times it's slowed down by the translation. But we're doing a really close watch on what people are trying and practicing. We also do a lot of teaching with games because if you are going to do a two-week training, it's a long time to sit there. So if it's not going to involve a lot of activities and games, it's going to be hard for anybody to pay attention. And in areas or cultures where it's hard for one person to come up and role play on their own, we do more group activities like this where people can come up as a group and do an activity and maybe show an answer without having to speak out if you're more shy or less comfortable or worried about how people will feel if you maybe don't get it quite right. So we do a lot of group things. And these seem to work everywhere. Here's some pictures from training in Zambia where we were having competitions about whether you could get all the ideas down to cognitive coping. We have a certain way we teach it. So we had them work through on papers, putting the steps of teaching cognitive coping in order because people have not done a strategy like cognitive coping before. So we end up having a lot of fun at the trainings. Um, Another game where we're having clinicians think about, or the lay counselors think about a case and put the treatment components in order, so they're really having to think through case vignettes. And, you know, our idea and the feedback we get from counselors is that this is a part of the training they enjoy the most is when we can turn the training into more of a game. So we try to actually bring a lot of that into the way we train in the U.S. now, too. You might wonder how much of the intervention we have to change when we go to other countries. So first of all, I'm not a cultural expert 
really for anything but myself, right, and the culture that I grew up in and the culture I live in. So everywhere we go, we partner locally with an organization and with individuals who we teach the intervention to, and they think about what needs to be tweaked here, what needs to be, what needs to be changed here to make it fit, while maintaining the core elements. So there's a nice paper by Vikram Patel talking across a lot of studies have been done um, in a few different countries where they kind of collapse in a table like this, what they had to change, what didn't need significant adaptation, and what did. And basically the take home point is people changed how training was conducted to do some of the things like I talked about, local idioms and stories, adding those things in, simplifying terms and avoiding clinical terms like depression. So we talk about it's a program or a class, not a treatment. Um, that supervision needs to be more intensive and you need to find a way to build in the local supervision. And that obviously the intervention has to be situated within the local context. You can't just take it and plunk it down. There are things that you need to work with your local team and experts in the culture to adapt. So some of the things that we've done is try to think about taking aspects like cognitive restructuring and changing them to be called things like thinking in a different way, because that's all cognitive restructuring really is. And having ideas to help people learn a complicated process like Socratic questioning, where you teach with questions, where you're really trying to elicit from the individual what they think, to use analogies like, you know, if you give a man a fish, he can eat for a day. So if you like tell someone how to think, they might feel better just right in that moment, right? But it doesn't last. But if you teach a man to fish, they can eat for a lifetime. So if you teach a client or the child you're working with to bring out from themselves using elicitation methods how to think and feel better, then they can keep feeling better for a long time. So we've done things like that and played games with like, are you giving them a fish, which is a fish head, or are you teaching them to fish with a fishing pole? Um, another example of local adaptation, so Raman's work in Pakistan, he's done some amazing work where they had local artists draw all of their treatment manual to display pictures that would all be culturally syntonic in the area for all the counselors so that even the treatment manual has pictures that fit. In Colombia, um, where everyone went salsa dancing after the training, we actually came up with a cognitive restructuring dance to be able to think through all the different steps that were involved where you had, you know, we had verses and we had a chorus and I think their favorite part was me dancing because it was not very good. Um, in all of our thought sites, we're monitoring fidelity. So we want to make sure that even as you change little things, the core elements are being delivered. Because delivered. if they're not, we're not really testing TFCBT in Tanzania and Kenya. We're testing something else. So the way that we've talked about this is, you know, cooking is big in any culture. So we talk about we're all following the same recipe, right? So TFCBT has nine elements. We're all going to do those nine elements, just like if you're going to make a curry, it might have potato, and it might have eggplant, and it might have cauliflower. But the spices are unique to who's making that curry, right? So it might taste a little different in different places. So we encourage spice. We encourage what's talked about as like um, adaptation at the periphery. So, but we try to get everybody to follow the main recipe with the main ingredients. So I was just in Tanzania a few weeks ago, and one of the things that we were talking about is how did you spice it up? And everybody was saying, well, we just added a little bit of spice. Let me tell you what I did for a little bit of spice. And so I think hopefully over time we're getting actually better outcomes because we're monitoring fidelity, but we're encouraging this type of adaptation. So our counselors write these fidelity reports. I should say that before I move on. And in supervision, they um, talk with a local supervisor about what they did, but there's a report that I see as the expert. So I get a chance to look at this report and be an external monitor of fidelity to help the local supervisor maybe ask new questions, like, well, ask about this, how did this go? And then also on the reports, they report the spice so that we can see what people are doing differently. So I want to show you some outcomes. So for the feasibility study, for the 64 kids, again, this is uncontrolled. So I'm showing you effect sizes which represent the strength of the magnitude or the strength of what we found. This is uncontrolled, so this is an effect size from pre to post, not comparing control and intervention, and I'll show you some of those data later. But basically, kid, by kid and guardian report, kids cut their post-traumatic stress symptoms by half or more by the end of treatment. That was maintained at three months, and what's kind of amazing to me is that it was maintained at 12 months. I'm always skeptical of my own data and everyone else's data, but you're most skeptical of your own sometimes, I think. And I expect people to drop, because sometimes their scores might be higher. We know that about studies, right, when you get into the study. 
And I wasn't that surprised that it was the same at three months, but the fact that the three-month follow-up to the 12-month follow-up was the same made me feel a little hopeful. We see actually a similar effect on depression, so by both child and guardian report, reduction by about half with maintenance of gains at three months and 12 months, but again, uncontrolled. We only asked about grief symptoms from children because if you look at most of the measures for grief, they don't get the guardian report or caregiver report even in the US just because I think they think that's something really only the child can report on how they feel in terms of grief, so we didn't get guardian. But kids came down um, substantially also on their grief symptoms, cut them in half with maintenance over time. So those are some of the outcomes, but let me show you a few more. So the develop, one of the developers of TFCBT asked Susan and Leonia, who are counselors in the first study and are supervisors in the current study, to make a short video for a conference they had on TFCBT, and so I wanted you to hear from them what they thought about the intervention. Hi everyone, we are from Tanzania, CBT staff members dealing with the children who lose one or two parents. I'm Leonia Rugalabam. I'm Susan Tomale. We like to receive this session to our country. It helps for child a lot. Children change a lot. They think in a positive way and they think there are other people who love them, care about them. Also, caregivers like this session because it helps them so much to shape their children's behavior. Giving an example to the child who was very aggressive, having worries and very sad after losing his father, he really changed it after receiving the CBT treatment. He started feeling better. He started performing well at the school. Even the teachers were asking us which kind of model we given to this child so that we can give others. Asante! Asante! So some of the data is in your numbers, and sometimes some of your data is the perspective of people who are on the ground seeing the intervention. You can't have one or the other. It's nice to have both, I think. <laughs> so what do we learn? Lay counselors can deliver the intervention. The outcomes at least go in the expected direction. It was uncontrolled, so we can't say if they would have gotten better without intervention, but at least they didn't go the wrong way. Kids and guardians came. The improvement was maintained over time, and we got a lot of positive feedback from the guardians and from teachers who said, what did you do with these kids? Because we'd like to get more kids doing the way these kids are doing. But it didn't have a control group. So what I want to show you, I think these pieces of data go nicely together. So the RCT that we did in green that I have circled here in, in Zambia, we didn't have a long enough period to do a follow-up, but it was a controlled study. So from the Tanzania study, you're seeing uncontrolled outcomes, but maintenance over time. And then what I wanted to show you from Zambia is that we actually had really substantial effects. So this effect size is 2.39, which is a pretty amazing effect size for post-traumatic stress. Very well done, rigorous, randomized, controlled trial with kids in the TFCBT condition. And this is a mean score instead of a total here, just because they work with a mean score instead of a clinical total. But again, reducing their scores by more than half. And we don't have the maintenance because the study period was super short. But if you combine the two, we've got maintenance in Tanzania, but uncontrolled. And here, you've got the controlled. The one thing is, we loved that effect size. I'm really happy about that. We were pretty bummed about this one. We really care about functioning because if we're ever going to get funding for mental health and if it's going to be part of a country's budget, we need to be able to show that improving mental health improves functioning. So we're not sure here if it was our measure or actually if we're not able to target functioning in the way that we would like. We use locally developed from these qualitative, the work I talked about doing in Tanzania, we have a similar ethnographic process for finding out what do kids do that are doing well here by boys and girls, because it is, like Kate mentioned, separate by sex. So they didn't do as well as we'd like, effect size 0.34. It's a small effect, so it's still a, it's still a significant effect, but I would obviously like to see that be much higher. So hopefully we can come back and tell you more in a few years when we have our functional outcomes from a large study we're doing now. So we've got even more results right now from TFCBT that I won't go into now, but there were two small randomized controlled trials in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, where also we had um, very significant effects for post-traumatic stress, distress, and pro-social behavior for war-affected boys and girls. And Laura Murray had a, another feasibility study in Zambia with orphaned and vulnerable kids where, like our first study in Tanzania, kids did a lot better. What I'd like to show you before I wrap up, though, is what we're doing now. 
So we're currently in the middle of a large randomized trial um, in Moshi, Tanzania and Bungoma, Kenya, where we have six counselors in each site. And the counselors from the feasibility study, Leonie and Susan being two of them that you just saw, they were the co-trainers and they're the direct supervisors. So I do not supervise the counselors. Leonia, Susan, and uh, Simon, another supervisor, did all of the supervision. We're treating, we're enrolling 640 kids. Half get TFCBT, half get usual services. It, result, it works out to 20 TFCBT groups in each country, and they're assessed on the same frequency. So at baseline, three months, six months, and then at 15 months. And basically what we did was a counselor promotion. If you were a counselor in the first study, you're a supervisor now, thinking about like an apprenticeship model. So you learned your skills as counselors, let's move you up to supervisors. They got to come to the US, so we planned our training here. And then we did the training together. And our apprenticeship model really relies on supervisors like Mama Louie to be the link between the trainers and the counselors because we see that as a much more sustainable and feasible approach because then the relationship is between the counselors and the supervisors. And we're just more on the outside doing a little bit of quality control and helping the supervisors do their job well. So what you see here is actually our supervisors on Skype talking to us weekly. So the call with them, that seems a long time ago, was this morning at 6 a.m. because of the time change. And so we talk about the groups and how the treatment, this is a long day to do a call with them at 6 a.m. and then this talk. So that, you know, we talk with them about how treatment provision is going. We review the reports and discuss it. And if I have any questions for follow-up, we discuss it. If they have any questions for me. And one of the things I like about this current grant is those supervisors that I just showed you, they're supervising counselors who are on site with them in Tanzania, but also counselors who live in Bengoma, Kenya, who they only see in person twice a year. So the pictures you're seeing here is the, this is the Bengoma group in Kenya practicing. They're demonstrating, they're leading a guardian group or a child group, they're doing it. And here's the group in Tanzania watching them, that's them that you see on the computer there. And so it gives a nice option. If we can show that we can supervise these treatments from afar, then you could have like an East African hub of expertise who could go in person to train people, but the supervision could be remote. And internet gets better and better every day in low and middle income countries, allowing technology to be a big assist in being able to do this type of work. So in the current study that we have with the 640 kids, we are interested in clinical outcomes. We're gonna see how these kids do compared to a control group who do not get the intervention. But what I'm mainly interested in is the implementation outcomes. How's the fidelity when all the supervision is done locally? Does it, how, what's attendance look like? Is acceptability any higher the further out I get from the picture? What, how do the providers learn? What's their knowledge like when they're co-trained by locals with me and not just by an expert? And what's that supervisory relationship like? Because I would hope that they can come to their local supervisors with mistakes more easily than you could an expat who you also can only reach by Skype at certain ends of the day given the time difference. So I'm really interested in these implementation outcomes because I think these will inform the questions about sustainability. So you might think this is a fabulous picture of a water bottle, but what it just happens to have a water bottle in the foreground. But what it is is this was our training. So Leonia, Mama Louie is leading, Dada Leonia is at the board, I'm sitting. This is how I spent the training. I think I stood, Elizabeth McCauley was there, I don't know, I stood very rarely. They, they ran the show. We plan, practiced in the morning about what they were gonna do, we talked at the end of the day, we huddled you know, in between the practice groups, but they ran the training. And I'm gonna play this for you. The one thing is, this is in English. I hope you'll be able to catch it because you'll be able to make out Simon's accent, but you'll hear him explaining to the group what he's doing. He does some Swahili and then goes back to English, but he's walking them through and you get to see a little bit of just what he's talking about in terms of the intervention and the expertise of these individuals. I'd pit them against anybody in the U.S. delivering this intervention. Oops, sorry. Are Java policy defenders what is this like from the palace of life? wakati mwingine alikuwa ananichukua and tukana na alizimizia mimi ndiye ndiye tukana so still the same remember about that event it was a, a time ago but it was a still remember something which he didn't like it from the father of that and here are the list to talk about so we ask them to come up with a list to talk about and this list we let them to, to, to find out which one is easiest to the hardest one so as you see 
ni chale halazi la like 24 event siku aliyo zikwa alikuwa anatukana uh, siku aliyo aliyo vunja walipo vunja tanga sijui vunja tanga ni nini nino vunja tanga sijui that's me saying i don't know sijui but basically, I mean, you can see he's naturally a leader, like taking people through it. He's going on the slide. He's checking to see if people understand. Leonie is writing the key points on the overhead. They just did an amazing job. So this is our group of counselors from Tanzania and Kenya. They're really outstanding in every way. I just was so glad to see all of them recently. And we don't know our outcomes yet because in the middle of a randomized controlled trial, you're not really allowed to look. Um, we're three years into the trial. We've enrolled over 600 kids. We've completed 30 groups. We've got really high child and guardian attendance and apparently very positive feedback. When I was there just a few weeks ago, they were saying when they're in villages for other things that a guardian will say, that's my teacher. That's my teacher going there. And the people are very respectful. And in fact, the problem has been some of the control families have been hearing good things about the group and been really requesting to get the intervention, which is always the hard role as a researcher because you want everyone to get it. But if they do, then you can't really figure out if it works or not. So we're hearing some good things, but we'll have to see. One or two things about sustainability. The context of global mental health is a really challenging one. Um, the WHO recommends that the minimum that you spend on per, ca per capita on healthcare is $60. From 2000 to 2008, Sub-Saharan Africa went from spending 15 to 41. So that's a big jump, but we're still well below the 60 that's recommended. So it's hard to find a place for mental health in a budget that's already too tight just for health care. And the problem is when people give money, often countries cut back their own spending. So there's been some data showing that as countries, as expats or, you know, outsiders and foreigners give money, the country cuts back their spending on that health care item. So it's a pretty challenging context, and it seems like to be able to improve things, we've got to prove that we have treatments that work. And we've got to improve that mental health treatments that help people get better in terms of mental health outcomes actually increase functioning and contribution to the society or the community. So we've got some work to do because we need to make, I think we're doing pretty well on the first one, but we've really got to make the second link. So sustainability is a big question. Some of the things that we're doing in our research now that I'm probably the most excited about is thinking about how do we test implementation strategies to situate these effective treatments in existing settings using existing staff members like Ministry of Health clinics or some of the locally developed community-based organizations that seem to have a foothold and may continue. I'm also interested in broader treatment approaches. Something like TFCBT is great for grief and post-traumatic stress in orphans, but what about just depression or what about just anxiety or what about post-traumatic stress and general anxiety but not so much difficulty with like a behavior problem for a child? We can't train lay counselors in eight different approaches. So we've been working on, we developed and tested now some work out on a common elements approach that boils down the common elements across evidence-based interventions to teach counselors one set of strategies and how to put them together for different presenting problems. We also were working on building a cadre of local trainers so that we wouldn't have to have expats going over. Every flight's $2,000, and then every day that you're there is expensive. We want to build up things like an East African hub, for example, that could be trainers and then do the supervision. So we're trying to look at things like moving from an apprenticeship model that I showed you before to a train the trainer model where we can train people to do the training and the supervision themselves. And then once you start getting some of these treatments established, how do we keep building local responsibility? And honestly, maybe outcomes are going to get better and better the more locally responsibility, more local responsibility there is because people are taking ownership for the intervention. They're delivering it in a way that fits best culturally as they keep trying it. So I just want to show you one of the counselors from two weeks ago why I'm so interested about local trainers. So this is just one of our counselors talking about praise, one of the parenting skills that they teach to try to help guardians recognize positive behavior and also start to build that relationship. And she's not been trained to be a trainer, but she's just a natural. Okay, the person that you are going to tackle, just like Mama Leila correctly remember, is praise. And you remember we talked about some things about praise, some of the rules about praise and how we are supposed to be praising our children, yeah? Can someone tell me what exactly can they remember or how exactly have they been doing praise with their children? Yes? 
Guardian. Uh, in place, I remember uh, I've been telling my Naomi uh, that thank you very much for me. Thank you very much for what she did to me. Okay, very good, and you've been doing a good job because you've been thanking your Naomi, and thanking is telling positive words, yeah? yeah? And after praising and thanking your Naomi for cleaning, and you've been specific, you've mentioned the activity that Naomi has done for you, which is very good. I'm proud of you as a teacher, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Any other guardian who has been praising the child? Yes. Yeah. I praise my child after taking taking a walk and I told her that congratulations my dad and my congratulations my daughter for facing this mm -hmm. And how did your daughter baby react? She, she said that she came close. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did she fetch water again? So I'll pause it there. Did you hear her last question? How did she react and did she do the behavior again? So she's like getting at that one of the points of praise is it's designed to make the child feel good, but also to help the behavior occur again. So just naturally engaging the group. That's a group of counselors that she's role playing with, but just these amazing skills and doing things. That's not how I lead a group. She's doing it the way that it works best there, which is really awesome. So we've done some of this work in Iraq. We're going to have outcomes soon, we hope, to see if um, this study is adults, but if adults treated by local counselors who are trained by local trainers do as well as our past study where clients were treated by local counselors who were trained by experts who came from the U.S. So we're going to be able to compare outcomes for clients and see if the training models are just as effective. So just to go ahead and move forward because it's getting late, I want to show you just some outcomes from one of these common elements approaches, which is one of the things that we are excited about. This is an adult trial and this is a kid talk. But our hope is to start doing some of these common elements work with kids because we think they have a lot greater reach and possibility because of the fact that, again, you could treat anxiety, depression, PTS, or behavior problems. So in a trial on the Thai-Burma border with adults, we had really nice effects with an effect size of 1.16. For depression and for post-traumatic stress, it was also over 1. This was a uh, sophisticated, randomized, controlled, very well-designed study. And we also actually here did a little better on functioning, which I was happy about, but still 0.6 of an effect size versus over one. So we've got a little work to do on figuring out the functioning piece still, like I said, which is a big part of sustainability. If you're interested in this, this is just recently out in PLOS Medicine, which is an open access journal, so you can look it up. And with that, I would like to wrap up before we reach the full nine o'clock hour. Great job, Shannon. Can we open it up for questions? Again, when you have questions, we're going to ask you to come down to the mics. And we have time for a couple before we're going to end up. Yep. If you have a question, you'll have to go to the microphone, please. Yes, I'm wondering if you are actually working with uh, the woman who spoke earlier. What's her name? Yep, Kate. Professor Wetton. Kate, yeah. Uh, with her, um, her studies that she has, and it uh, um, seems like you have the, um, all the, uh, the criteria that it takes to actually implement um, the studies that she has here in the United States and the communities. And um, it seems like if you two got together, you could really, yeah, you so know, make we an do explosion work of, uh, you know, a nonprofit that would really take off. Yeah. Yeah, so we work together on the Tanzania and Kenya, the trauma-focused CBT study that I was just talking about, and then half my work is in the U.S., which I didn't get to talk about today. But you're exactly right. I mean, all this stuff makes sense for here, and we do a lot of the same stuff, and one of the clinicians in one of my studies is here, and we do a lot of these similar things in the U.S. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Over here in the green chair. Yes. Um, I was curious if there kind of building on what she was saying, if there's a dialogue of using these systems and implementing them here in the U.S. to kind of create a, uh, 
an alternative to a growing popularity of psychiatric drug treatments for for these problems yeah, or, and so also implementing them in public education as I've always been curious as to why public education in the United States doesn't really regard being happy as an adult as something to learn. Yeah, well, you know, they actually say the school, schools are the ipso de facto mental health system in the U.S., really, because they're dealing with it. My colleague Elizabeth McCauley is here who does most of this exact same work in the schools trying to get it to kids for exactly that reason, and we need to do more of that. And I think every time we do something here, we take a little bit of that globally, and every time we do something globally, we bring a little of it back. So TFCBT, for example, Lucy Berliner is here. We have an eight-year-long initiative implementing trauma-focused CBT, the same intervention in Washington State. And my Tanzania and Kenya counselors got to, when they came to the U.S., they spoke to about 100 of them, and the U.S. counselors were just amazed with their work, and they got to share a lot of ideas. And uh, just one other question. If I Google MH gap, is that a good way to find out how to get involved? So if you Google MH Gap, that'll give you the WHO link. And if you're interested in how to get involved like with this type of research, Google yes. Dorsey Lab. Dor Dorsey Lab? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, over here in the block. Uh, thank you. This is a very wonderful talk. Um, I'm really glad I came here. I almost didn't come after work today, and uh, I'm really glad I did. Um, yes. This, because, um, yeah, this is, a lot of this has resonated with me. And my question is, thank looking at the, yeah, no, it was great. Um, Looking at all this uh, data with control groups, I guess I just started thinking, I'm, I'm kind of coming from the epi world here, mm -hmm. and I'm a little curious uh, what, like, or, or some of your examples were with usual care as well as kind of the baseline. Have you ever, maybe this is in your bigger study and you're doing now, but I guess it got me thinking, have you done any sort of intermediary groups that kind of get the non-evidence-based like kind of a, almost a, I, I would call it a, you know, kind of a after school program type, just a social environment type thing without yeah, yeah. the evidence-based intervention. And it's a great question because I mean, what we yeah. have are usual care weightless control comparison conditions which don't control for attention, right? So they don't, we're testing a particular treatment but it's not being tested against some other treatment or some other thing like a social support group to see is it just having any support that matters or is it really this evidence-based intervention? So I think that that's actually the place we need to go next. We just need them to give us a little more money so we can pay for both the treatment we want to test and the one that would be the comparison group. But it's a great point. And if you're asking, do the non-evidence-based ones work internationally? I'm not sure if that's what you're also asking. I had to cut two recent studies that came out published in 2013 or 2014 that weren't evidence-based practices and weren't CBT. They were more generalized interventions, and those didn't have the same effects. So it does seem that we're narrowing in on, you know, a strong intervention like CBT that has a good dose on relaxation and coping skills building and exposure where they talk about the bad things that happen do lead to positive outcomes or associated with positive outcomes, and more general interventions weren't. Very cool. Thank you. Over here. Hello. Um, so how do I ask this? I find, I find this, this research really interesting, um, but I'm also really interested in, in, this, in this field. Um, how do you, and to a lot of people, um, I think it's, it often comes as kind of detached and far away and, and they're really removed. How do you suggest um, getting people motivated and getting people to actually be engaged in these kinds of issues because to you know, most people, um, and I'm not really, a, I'm not big on research. To most people, you know, numbers and data is just kind of like, it's just numbers and data. Um, whereas like, you know, individual stories are a lot more compelling and get right, people right. motivated. But how do you, you know, I guess, suggest getting other people to be um, motivated to actually be involved in these kinds of issues? You mean to like really care about them? Like what is it we need to do to get people in other countries or here to care about it and support it? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Well, I think you're right that numbers can just put people to sleep. That's why I'm glad you guys are here and still awake and you haven't walked out yet. And things like the videos and the stories about individual kids do seem to be really compelling and often relate to legislation in the U.S., right? Not numbers, but a personal story. So it's a great question. I'm not entirely sure how we do that best. I think we need to talk to people who do marketing and figure out how they sell Coca-Cola in places that people can't get clean water and figure, you know, because those are the strategies that get people to care about and take action. So... I'm interested in those kind of approaches, but I don't know if that fully answered your question. Thank you. Okay, last question. 
I sort of have a question about the data that you were presenting. So it looked as though over time everybody got better. And is that because of cross-contamination? And was it statistically significant, clinically significant? And what do you think the effect was over time? Is it just because people get better and depression gets better on its own? Or is it because there was cross-contamination? Or what do yeah, you think Yeah, you know, happening? we don't, we haven't worried too much about cross-contamination because you had to be in the group to, like, get the group. Right. But I think, you know, with these scores, you get into the study because you have a high score, right? And those can only usually go down over time, like either regression to the mean or natural kind of waving of symptoms going down a little bit. So that's why I actually like the effect sizes. So for the controlled studies, you know, you're seeing both groups are getting better, but you see a big difference in the bars for the control versus intervention. Mm -hmm. But for Zambia, like the effect size when it was 2.36, that basically means those intervention kids were substantially more likely to get better than control, even though the control do start to go down. So effect sizes can be nice ways to look at it, because otherwise, when you're kind of looking over time, it's hard to see. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Again, thank you, Professor Dorsey.